the Moyo Heart Center, where we, are, where we offer transformational talks, interviews, webinars, and podcasts for open-hearted people searching for inspirational truth to heal themselves, their families, their communities, and ultimately the world. So, hey, what's up with us? It's the topic of tonight's webinar. So regularly and more recently, I've been feeling really uncomfortable at many levels as a white privileged South African. Some of it is unconscious race bias, and sometimes it's actually conscious. The series of podcasts are really personal for me. I'm searching for ways to heal. As a platform, we recognize that race is a huge obstacle in us as individuals, a community, and a species in finding oneness and being a collective whole. As this conversation is yours, as much as it is ours. In honor of Human Rights Month in South Africa, we have dedicated a five session series of podcasts to spirit-led race conversations, starting tonight and continuing for four weeks every Tuesday at 7 p.m. from the 9th to the 30th of March. I am excited, I am delighted to introduce um, the two race specialists that we have invited to join this conversation and lead us through the spirit-led dance. Dr. Mahati Mokwena and Ilka Oklers are joining us tonight. I am not going to introduce each of our speakers tonight. I think it is really important, Mahati, that you introduce yourself, tell the audience why you're here, um, and a little bit about, about yourself. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Cindy, for that for that welcoming and receiving us into the space. It's, um, gosh, I, I cannot believe that we are here from our very initial conversations to, to arriving at this point, this moment in time, where we get to really delve into this <laughs> prickly, often prickly, um, but really, potentially nourishing conversation and um and just to say i'm a little bit anxious to be called a specialist <laughs> i i i just want to be known as somebody who um who is walking this journey with one another this journey of race with each other and to introduce myself well, um, I grew up in Mamelodi in Pretoria. Mamelodi is a, um, is a dusty, streeted township. Even today, most of it is, some of it is. Um, but certainly when I was growing up, it very much was a dusty, streeted township. And, um, and I, grew, I, grew, I grew into a family of, um, of Catholics and traditional healers, people who were straddling the two. And, and grew up pretty much um, shielded from issues of race when, um, when I was young, um, until about, hmm, until about um, the 70s, mid 70s, I was nine years old in standard three. And for the very first time in my life, I experienced tear gas. I experienced utter turmoil in my home environment, in, um, in my community with um, the political uprising um, that was instigated by young school kids who were saying no to being educated in Afrikaans and to being taught Afrikaans. And, and that saw the unraveling really of, um, of the apartheid regime and, and brought us to where we are today. And in that time, even though school was disrupted very badly, um, my parents, who both didn't really have much of an education, I think they probably didn't go up to or go beyond standard six, uh, and yet were fiercely accomplished and incredible in themselves. Um, they instilled the importance of education. They knew 
that in order to survive this confounding experience, that somehow if their children got the education, maybe they might get somewhere. And um, and so and so it is that they pushed all of us to get education as far as we could, and and I ended up at a at a private school. Actually, I was twelve years old when my mother, um, I want to say, made me. Made me is such a difficult phrase, but but she told me to apply to go to attend a school um, outside of the township because in the township school was disrupted. So I applied. Went to the went to a, a school, a private school in Pretoria, and um, and after that, and I have a story, but I'll tell that story later. I have a story about that experience. I'll share it later. Um, but after school, um, I went to to UWC first, and then I transferred to Grahamstown to Rhodes, um, um, Makanda, and I did my BA and my honors in psychology and anthropology and drama and went ahead and did, I was lucky enough to get a Fulbright scholarship, uh, which took me to the US to do my master's in the expressive arts therapies, culture shock, <laughs> and realizing that, hmm, I thought the world was small, hang on. <laughs> mm, the world is much smaller for, for, for many. But when I came back from the US, then I did my, um, my doctoral degree at RAU, Rance Afrikaans Universität, Rand Afrikaans University in Johannesburg. It's now known as UJ. And of course, at that time, when I was there, I was teaching, it, teaching there as well. And I think there's some experiences I will refer to through these conversations. Um, but throughout this journey, I constantly, I was, I was walking this journey of my education, but the education actually was an uneducation because all my education brought me to the realization of a deep hunger in me to really get to know who I am, the truth of who I am, with the clear understanding that what I'm being taught here is actually not about me. It's actually more in service of a particular system and particular structures that are put in place to maintain particular privilege that, that excludes me. But that requires my service to exist and to survive. And so my journey of spirituality has been about that. It has been a deep, deep questioning of, but surely not. Surely this cannot be it. And, um, and so I have, I have placed myself in many, in many contexts where, I, um, where my work has been about figuring out who we are as human beings. What is it that makes us, us? And how can we liberate ourselves from the confines of, um, hmm, of a world that would have us be a slave race and serve it for its own purposes. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I work as a, as a leadership facilitator, personal leadership facilitator, and, and my work goes across the board and it's always about coming back home here. And I am here, I am here. What brings me to this particular space? And I have to say, I would much rather not be here. This is not a conversation I, I, I look forward to with glee. I, um, it's a difficult conversation. It's an exhausting conversation. I'm exhausted, I'm exhausted. And, um, but I'm here because I was called to be here. And so I bring my openness and I bring this vessel in order to participate in a way that speaks not only my truth, but that can communicate whatever needs to be heard and so that I can receive whatever I need to receive. 
That's me, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you so much for that insight. And I've learned things that I never knew. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you over the next five weeks more and more. And and I and I honor the vessel that you've brought. And I too um share that vessel of openness and, and a sharing of authenticity with you, um, Khati, because I think that is so important. Um, and thank you again for, for being with us. And I'd like to introduce Ilsa or Ilsa to introduce herself and give us some background and some context as to how we've arrived here or how she has arrived here this evening. Thanks, Cindy. Mahati, thank you. Thank you. I want to start by saying, before I introduce myself, I just want to start by saying that I want to acknowledge the gift of Mahati's presence. Because these race conversations are experienced very differently for us situated as racialized whites and for somebody who comes with Mahati's background and with her experience. And so, yeah, I, I want to honor that. I want to just actually, as you've already done, Cindy, but to just take a moment and to honor that. Um, this is not a, an, a two-way kind of uh, conversation if, as if we were talking about um, something external to us. Um, this is a conversation that has its own power dynamics embedded in it. And it is that embodied experience of how we come differently to these conversations that make it an extra burden on black hearts and minds and bodies. It costs black people more than it costs us whites to have these conversations. And yet sisters and colleagues and comrades show up time and time and time again, they show up to have these conversations. And so we want to receive it as a gift. And I want to start, I want to start in that way. Um, so Mahati said two things that um, I can weave back into my own introduction. And the first was, of course, Afrikaans. So that oppressive force, that oppressive energy, um, that that was this, you know, the catalyst for this revolutionary spirit amongst, amongst the youth. That was my identity, that was me. I grew up uh, under apartheid, during apartheid, um, in a home, an Afrikaner nationalist home <clears throat> with parents um, and a family who were prominent politicians in the nationalist party. So that myth about how no white person ever voted for the nationalist party, well, uh, my family were dedicated um, participants, active members and prominent members of the Nationalist Party. So I grew up in that environment. And also, of course, there's the Christian element, that Africana Christian nationalism. Um, and I, yeah, I've got pictures of them with three successive prime ministers, starting with B.J. Foster when they were a new, youngly married couple, very proudly, um, and then followed on to the old Groot Krokodil, those who are old enough to remember Pierre Vier, um, with him with his hat and that sort of stance, you know, that sort of like, that fascist sort of stance. And then, of course, Effie de Klerk, who was a close friend, very close friend of, 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 my, of my family and of my parents. Um, but the other connection, Mahati, is that I grew up in Makanda. I grew up in Grahamstown. And this provided a very interesting dimension to my upbringing, because those who knew, know Grahamstown will know that there are two very powerful forces in Grahamstown. The one is the Isikosa nation. It is, it's a place that throbs with the energy of the Tulsa people. And on the other hand, there are the colonists, the settlers, the British. There are something like 55 cathedrals. There are multiple kind of English private schools. People send their children from all over the continent to these private, very elite private schools in Grahamstown. 
And of course, there's also the university. And in this context, the Afrikaans community in Grahamstown was quite looked down upon. We were the rock spiders. We were the, um, the sort of uncouth, the kind of Buddha. Um, and there was a certain kind of uh, dignity in the Klosa people. And there was a certain kind of entitlement with the English. Um, and the, Af the Afrikaner community was a, was a complete minority in that context. And as an anomaly to the rest of the country, obviously. But what it afforded me, which I think is the greatest gift that, that I received from my upbringing, was an experience both of superiority as a white person, but also to just be able to touch into what it feels like to be less than, to feel less than just a touch, just a touch of that feeling. So yeah, so my, I was the, my grandfather and my father were both lawyers in the Eastern Cape and in Grahamstown. I ended up studying law. I had a sort of political awakening at a very early age. And that's also something we'll talk more about in one of the subsequent sessions, because I believe that we all come into this world with an inherent sort of sense of right and wrong and that children inherently at a very young age um, know already. So I knew already, you know, from age, from, from when I can remember that there was something wrong um, with the system. And I became more and more politically awakened. Um, and then I decided to study law as well, but not to continue the family tradition of the law firm there at Grahamstown that had already been going for like, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, because it seemed to be like that was the only weapon that I could really use to challenge apartheid. You've got to treat like with like. So, you know, apartheid was a legal system and we had to fight it. And so I became a human rights lawyer and my career transitioned from that into, into facilitation and um, you know, after 1994, after the drafting of the constitution and so on. And for the last sort of 25 years, I've been doing facilitation, mostly of groups, organizations around issues of what we call in South Africa transformation, which means the legacy of apartheid on our psyches and on our institutions. Um, and so my, my whole life, really the theme of justice and equality and inequality has really threaded itself through my, through my whole life. Um, and my spiritual journey has run alongside that. I think there's something very, very closely connected. Our yearning for justice to me is spiritual. There is something very closely connected for me in, in my understanding of the kind of law that I work with and engage with and my spiritual practice. So that's me. Ilsa, thank you very much. And again, I've learned things I didn't know. And um, I'm looking forward to the journey um, as I come from an English background of, 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 white, of white privilege in, in, in South Africa and very much um, parents from the colonial side. So we really have this <laughs> balance. And yes, we did call them rock spiders at the time. So the bias continues. The bias continues and is there all the time. Um, Khati, I'd like to hand over to you to, to open and, and lead us. Thank you. Um, we're going to start with a, um, a mindfulness practice and invocation. Um, we recognize that this, this, these conversations are not really ours, but they are our service to a greater, sure, a greater purpose, a great something bigger than ourselves. And, and so um, I'm going to invoke the ancestors and the beings that walk with us. And I have snuff here, big old Nzu. <laughs> so I'm going to offer, I'm going to offer Mother Earth um, as I call on you, Kalibiza Luna Babotle. Hmm. And I invite all of you to think of your own ancestors. Who are the people that stand behind you? Your lineages, Galibita, call all of them. We call all of you to walk with us 
along this path. We know that this is a treacherous path. We know that we have walked it many times and we have gone around and around on the same issue over and over again and have not seen what we have not seen and have not understood what we have not understood and are even blind to what we do not know. And so we ask you, we call Great Spirit, we call God, we call um, the angels, we call Abutije, Sorali, Bizalona Babote, I call my own parents, Nanti, Sili Joseph, and my sister, my brother, Mogetzi Tepiso, Lona Baha, Ah, Tibete, Hmm, Balibiza Babote, Kakuba, Atamelan, Akeliza, my Lorona, shine your light upon our path. That even as we stray, even if we stray, we can find our way back home. We can find our way back to one another. Mm. Togoza Tobela. Ilza. Mm. Thank you. Mm. When I think of my ancestors, the place where I like to start are the ones who left this beautiful African continent. The time from before I was white. So from before I was white, I had ancestors here on this continent who left and took long journeys and traveled many roads and then returned for strange reasons. My original Ulker's ancestor came with the settlers, even though it was he was a German. He was apparently a kind of a doctor on one of the ships. It's not clear why he came. And he met here some local women. And of course, I cannot believe, even though I'd want to, that the relations were consensual and were equal. I can't believe that. I can't, it's, it's unlikely. It's unlikely, given the power dynamics, that those initial relations were not coercive. So, yeah, that is a, that is a moment to, to, to be with, a painful moment in terms of my ancestry to be with. Because even in Cape Town, there are many brown bodies with my surname many brown bodies, we share a surname. So I must have relations, distant, distant cousins who are in brown bodies. And then from the other side, my ancestors came as French Huguenots. And I know that they came because they were fleeing persecution in France at the time for their religion. That was at least part of the reason. I don't, I haven't delved into the history, but they also arrived on these shores with their own stories. And then I also have to spend a moment around the Boer War. I have to think about what happened there because if it wasn't for the Boer War, I can't see, or let me rather say, my immediate ancestors, my grandfather, my father, I know that they were good people. They were good men. And I've got a picture of my dad. I made a little shrine also on my, on my desk. But they were... They were blind. They were so overwhelmed by the what they had experienced um, through the Boer War, where I think my statistics are correct that one in three Afrikaners were actually killed during the Boer War. And um, of course, we know that a very large number, tens of thousands of Black people also suffered in the Boer War. And that immediately has to be said, right alongside this master narrative of, of the Afrikaners suffering in the Boer War. But there was definitely pain and suffering, incredible pain and suffering. My grandmother told stories about the aftermath of the Boer War um, and how or how very hard it was for them after the war. And then my grandfather and my father after him took up, they were activists in their own right, and they took up this cause for the destiny of the Afrikaner nation. 
but with this incredible blindness that we are all one and that we all belong together. Um, so I want to acknowledge the good and the bad, the light and the shadow, but I want to acknowledge ultimately um, that through their journey, incredible harm was done and is still and continues to be done in, in their name and also in my name. And I, I need to acknowledge that. Ilza, you were yes. going to share your poem. Yes. Mm. So thanks, thanks for that invitation, Mahati. So we we kind of we wanting to transition into into our conversation. It's all obviously already started, but um, when when we were preparing, I, I shared with Makati that when I do when I do this work in organisations, you know, often it's you know it could be quite a corporate type setting, and you know people think, well, you know, yesterday we spoke about um, you know team building and you know the strategy, strategic planning and whatever, and today we're going to kind of talk about race, and you kind of have to pause. You have to pause because this is sacred ground. This is not a conversation like any other. This is not a conversation that just a kind of a business kind of conversation or just a kind of a personal growth type conversation. And I often start with a poem and Mahati then really, really encouraged me to share the poem. So um, I want to then share this with us and it, with, with all of you. And it's called The Archbishop Chairs the First Session. And it's by Ingrid de Kock, who's one of our local Cape Town poets. On the first day, after a few hours of testimony, the Archbishop wept. He put his gray head on the long table of papers and protocols and he wept. The national and international cameramen filmed his weeping, his misted glasses, his sobbing shoulders, the call for a recess. It doesn't matter what you thought of the Archbishop before or after, of the settlement, the commission, of what the anthropologists flying in from less studied crimes and sorrows said about the discourse, or how many doctorates, books, and installations followed, or even if you think this poem simplifies, lionizes, romanticizes, or mystifies. There was a long table, starched purple vestment, and after a few hours of testimony, the Archbishop chair of the commission, laid down his head and wept. That's how it began. Ilza, I'm curious. Thank you for that. Thank you, sure. Mm. Mm. And I'm curious to hear, and perhaps this is just a taste of what is to come, but um, what is what is what is that poem for you? So for me, it is about this question of how do we begin? How do we begin? How do we enter into these conversations? So Cindy has already mentioned that this is a series of five conversations, and we're really hoping. I mean, we've got 50 people on the call. We've had amazing comments already in the chat and we're really hoping you're gonna walk this month with us. But how do we begin? And if we're not very, very careful how we begin, we can reinforce, re-enact, re-embody all that harm and all that suffering and oppression in the very way in which we enter into these conversations. And so for me, what it is, is for me, it is about how we begin and that we have to accept that the way we begin is with weeping, with weeping, 
with grieving for what has brought us here. Yeah, yeah. Acknowledgement of that deep, deep pain that lies not only um, within the, the black experience, but also in the white experience. And I think that's part of the complexity that we will be referring to as we go through our conversations with one another. Um, and being part of this conversation um, or, or one of the audience members, just know that today really what we are doing is, is Sitting the scene, we are paving, or maybe even still cleaning that ground before we can lay the paving, and um, and 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 we do that, and acknowledge that first and foremost we are explorers of this. We are not experts; we cannot take ourselves as experts, but we are exploring. And, and in this exploration, then what Cindy spoke about, you know, we bring deep vulnerability, we bring deep openness, we bring deep curiosity, whilst also being aware of our own biases, our own stereotypical ways of seeing the world, actually with our own recognition that it is so hard to know ourselves, never mind know one another. And yet that journey, that journey to self and that journey to one another is absolutely the thing that will save us humanity. And we are custodians of, of this. If we don't get it right, then we are letting everybody, every being on this earth down. And so we approach this with the, uh, with the important, hmm, with the acknowledgement that we are doing sacred, we hope to be doing sacred work. Um, I spoke earlier about my own trepidation, my own ambivalence about participating in this. And, and I, I, was, I was paging through my journal and, and I, ca I came across this poem, which speaks very clearly, cogently about the, the, the ambivalence that I spoke. So I'm going to read this poem that I wrote. I just discovered it in my journal um, this afternoon and it's called Beyond Black. <laughs> and it says, I'm not here to only be black. I did not come into this world to only be black. Blackness in, is inside of me. It is, however, not who I am. I am beyond black. There is not room enough in the entirety of this universe to contain all that I am. I am the multitude of all there is. A reminder, I am not an entity, a problem, your problem, to be dissected, analyzed, corrected, reduced to fit your limited understanding, to fit your fearful predictions and contracting control. I will not be black for you. I am divinity expressing its love through this black body. Don't you know, we are divinity expressing her love through our bodies. And this claiming of divinity is something that's really, when I read it, I thought, you know, my parents could never have written something like this because this black body is supposed to be the one that is lesser than, the one that is uh, barbaric, that is subhuman, the one that is, um, that needs to be, demo, dem, well, that is demonized. Um, that is, uh, and it's not an, it's not by accident that when you look at, issue when you look at pictures of angels they're always white 
And when you look at pictures of the devil, the devil is black. And it is a, a depositing subliminally of information inside of us to say that you as a black person, you belong on that side and whites only here. And so part of my ambivalence has to do with the recognition that irrespective of all the work I have done in order to connect with the divinity inside of me, with me as an aspect of divinity, when I step into this place, I have to go back and be black or else the work can be done. And so when you gave that acknowledgement, Ilsa, in the beginning, it really, it landed inside of me because it is saying, okay, there is a recognition that even though we are all walking this journey at we are, and we are all at different points, but in order for us to meet with one another, we need to somehow be with one another. And I have agreed to show up here because I know that we are both willing to, hmm, to be seen and to see. And I am hoping that, um, that the people that are walking with us are equally willing to be open to see, to be startled, to be bewildered, um, to be triggered, to be upset, because it's from those spaces that we can get to that weeping of the arch then we can begin. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, I just want to say at this point that there is this beautiful connection um, and this beautiful heart feeling um, that, that, that I'm experiencing and I can feel that everyone is experiencing. It's, it's like I've never felt before. And, and I think that you have both set this beautiful path now that's you you have opened this up and I and I hand back to you but I just needed to acknowledge this absolute heart energy um that is has been invoked and and the ancestral line that is with us right now is 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 beautiful and and I I feel very supported by yourselves in this process and I I feel very willing to open myself and I speak for our audience to open ourselves up to this conversation, but within the heart energy that we can feel between one another right now. And honoring the courage that is clearly presented. Thank you, Miriam. Um, and the tone and this beautiful heartfelt space that you've opened. I just want to acknowledge that from both of you and thank you um, on behalf of the audience for that as we hear people sharing in the chats, but it, it's almost driven to an emotion of tears with me. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Makati, you go. No, I was just gonna say I have a fan going because I'm having a hot flush. <laughs> <laughs> all that hot, all that hot scented activity is causing you a bit of <laughs> Yeah, but Human it's the body. ancestors. There are just so many that have created. I'm also, I don't normally sweat, but there's just this huge presence of we invited the ancestors and boy, they have arrived in there. I've seen ancestors I didn't know I had. <laughs> Maybe some of them were black, Cindy. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> or how my mother would have said that. <laughs> I will not to bring the yeah. time up. So I just, I just really want to, I really want to acknowledge this thing, you know, when Mahati and I spoke about this in, in, in advance and spoke about the ambivalence and, you know, when she shared that, you know, what these conversations ask of her is to go to, you know, to be black, to go back to being black as if black is sort of, you know, the, the identity. Um, and but as she said, without her stepping back into that, the work the work can't happen. Um, so yeah, so I think there was something that came up for me when you were talking about the the sort of the the your beautiful poem, 
um, and, and I had two experiences. The first experience was to me, and this is not, I don't think this is necessarily true of all white people, but for me, you know, there was suddenly a point of connection where I thought to me, whiteness is incongruent with divinity because of all the harm, because of all the harm that whiteness has perpetrated. It feels to me that as a white person, I need more redemption and more forgiveness. And it is a path for me to walk toward my own divinity um, that is not tainted by what, what I represent. My very being, my very being is oppressive. Me just showing up in a room can bring an oppressive energy. Um, me just standing next to a black person in a queue and being served first. Um, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm already embodying in my very body is what causes the pain, what causes the harm. Uh, so there's this interesting tension between how divinity is projected as all these white angels, um, but actually, um, you know, the black goddess, um, you know, that fertile, beautiful, unconditionally loving um, black goddess, uh, you know, to me has always represented more divinity than any of the white images that, that I've ever been presented with. Um, but what I, what I wanted to, to ask, and I, and I don't know if this is maybe taking us out of the heart space, but I'm, I trust Mahati that you'll, you'll respond in whichever way, you know, in, in a way that, that connects with truth. But I think many white people would, would want to know, you know, what, what creates a safe space? You know, we, we also wanting throughout this journey to identify sort of jargon and key words and key concepts that form part of the broader sort of race discourse. So that there's a little bit of a curriculum and a learning that is also embedded in this journey that we walk together. And I know that people often want to know, well, what creates a kind of a safe space? And I wondered if you wanted to say something about that. Sure. Um, and I'm going to preface it. I'm not going to preface it. I'm going to give the whole picture of, of, um, of what I am feeling um, inside of myself is immediately just to flag, to say that, um, that it takes both of us to establish what is safety. And, and in that, what I mean is I am wanting for us to step away from looking at the black body only as the injured body, um, only as being at the, and, and so it's, it's, it's that complexity of, of course, there has been great perpetration against black, upon black bodies, of course, through history. We know this, we know how it's all written um, upon the, back, the backs of black experiences and black bodies. At the same time, what my poem was saying was, do not diminish me into a victim. And they, because if that happens, what that automatically does is that it puts me into this experience of the one who is victimized, and it puts the white person into a particular experience of, um, of holding privilege. And depending on the inner work that a person is able to do, it's very easy to stay in the victim. It's very easy to stay in the place of, uh, of privilege. And what I am inviting, even within myself, is Makati, how can I crisscross between the two? and perhaps find a middle way, find a middle path that not only acknowledges 
the perpetration, but actually does something to correct it, to heal it within myself, because I know that when I work on myself in this particular lifetime, I know that it impacts all the ancestors who have experienced um, the perpetration upon their own bodies and have lost lives in order for me to be here. And so when I do that work, the healing isn't just benefiting me, it's benefiting all those who have come before me. And hopefully when I do this work, it impacts how I show up um, and how I show up then with, well, how I show up in the world and I encounter people who are, who are not like me, um, that when they have an experience of me, it is of, who. hang on a bit. I thought black people were like this, but how come this is, there's something different here. Let me look again. And so my invitation, what will create safety? What will create safety is let us look again. Let us keep looking and know that what we have believed to be the truth of who we are and the truth of who you are, perhaps is only a diminished truth. It's diminutive. And perhaps there is something much greater that, can, that is much closer to truth than our own tiny bit of understandings and conditioning that we have placed upon one, one, one another. And perhaps when we start expanding and allowing more truth to come in, perhaps that can deposit inside of us compassion for both of us. Again, Archbishop to do weeping. And, um, and the weeping, therefore, isn't only for the one who has experienced great perpetration, but it's equally for the perpetrator. This is just me. This is my own paradigm. It is also deep compassion for the perpetrator because they can, I ask myself, what has happened? What has happened? What has been perpetrated against you that you have given yourself permission to, um, to go to, to, to perpetrate such atrocities upon others? What has happened? What has happened? And what's that? what is the rock? What is the stone that is embedded in your heart that makes it impossible for you to access your heart? so that you can, so that maybe it can thaw a little bit and you can come back to being human. Both of us have lost. It's not just us black people. Again, I'm speaking from me. It is not just us black people that, that have lost, it's equally white people. And when one of, so the concept of Ubuntu I am because we are, we are therefore I am. When only one of us is healed, none of us is healed. When all of us are healed, then I too can, be, can feel safe enough to bring my injury so that my injury can then be in a space of healing. So what creates safety is that which serves both of us equally. Oh, that's beautiful, Mahati. That's so beautiful. That is so beautiful. I really, I, I hope, I'm sure it has absolutely pierced the heart of, of everybody who's, who's on this call. Um, and, you know, it reminds me of the, this elasticity of racism, you know, that you, that, that, that even in a moment, even if I reflect on myself in this very conversation, foregrounding the harm to such a degree inadvertently then you know elevates me mm -hmm. and and so that and so that 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 kind of you know internalized sort of superiority has this way of just you know morphing just morphing and representing itself it just you know it just finds a new way of presenting itself in the conversation and um what you what you've reminded me of is uh, you know, what, what Wendell Berry, this beautiful old American uh, uh, philosopher and earth worker, he's an incredible man, what he calls the invisible wound. And he wrote, he wrote a book on, on the, what he called the invisible wound, which is the way in which white people have been harmed by racism. 
and this very thing that you've been talking about around the dehumanization and the shutting down of the heart um, and the, the wound that, that racism has inflicted upon us um, and that we really are the ones in need of healing. You know, white people are really the ones in need of awakening and healing. Um, and at the same time that it seems like, um, you know, it seems like walking this path around becoming more conscious around race, you know, might bring that, might bring some of that, some of that healing. In the same way that racism is not a black issue, it's not a black problem, it is a white problem. It is an issue that belongs with white people that we have to somehow show up for and somehow resolve. And we have to come at it from that place that it is in order for our own, it's about our own healing. It is about our own healing. It is not buying into these distorted ideas of allyship um, which is about uh, some kind of charity understanding of racism and some kind of white savior, the kind white foreigner or whatever that I think somebody ref somebody referenced Chimamanda's TED talk about the single story. And she speaks about, you know, that, that kind white foreigner that kind of comes and saves the, saves the day. So that was a really beautiful, beautiful way of, of just articulating a space that is safe, but that is that has within it that understanding already of we sharing this in a in a in a way equally we are sharing this mm. this journey. Yeah, yeah. because mm. what remember that what what racism does it removes both of us. It removes both black and white people from connecting. With the, with the essence of who we really are, which is aspect of, of divinity. Mm -hmm. what, when, when, it, when you are propped up, which white privilege does, it props white people up and mm -hmm. it automatically assumes. So you, in fact, it keeps white people as perpetual infants. Yeah, I mean, if you can remember from, from propping up your children, I don't, I don't have any children, but my nephews and nieces when they were growing up as babies, we had to, we prop them up so they can learn to sit. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these structures are about propping white people up and being kept perpetually immature. When everything is given, when, when you are pandered to and privilege does that, it is saying you do not have capacity to do for yourself. You do not have capacity to be of service to another. You only need to be looking out for yourself. And in fact, don't worry, you don't even have to look out for yourself. We will look out for you. Mm -hmm. And the world is here to be in service of all mm -hmm. your needs and wants. What does it do for black people? It says that my gosh, we have to do so much work, not only to serve the other, to serve white people, but to serve ourselves. Because we, we also have families, we also have children. Mm -hmm that are needing our attention. So the prop, and, and, and it means then that there is an overmaturation. It's a parentifying in a way um, of, of black people. We, we step into spaces of looking after eyeballs. Mm. When, we, when we constantly look after mm. and what other people are constantly being looked after, mm. it creates a dynamic where none of us really has any opportunity to really connect with our true essence, which is aspect of divinity. And yet, in, in a very ironic way, we all have to walk this journey through these bodies, <laughs> but not get, not get stuck in that. Mm -hmm. And so part of my poem, what I didn't read, is about I'm not interested. I'm, I'm not here. My life is not dedicated to learning only about race. I'm not here only to master issues of race. There are other lessons I need to, to learn. And I, it is time for me to get on with those. I suggest you do the same. <laughs> mm, beautiful, beautiful. And I see, I'm just watching the time and I see that we've only got a few minutes left and we should share with, um, with our participants a little bit about our course and what's lying ahead. But, you know, just the last comment from me is that 
you know, you articulated so beautifully this world of white privilege and how it props up. And this term white fragility, I'm sure many of our panelists, <clears throat> I mean, of our participants have come across this term white fragility. And it's a, it's a contested term, I want to admit that, but I think that something of it is true because when you've been propped up, you know, uh, as, that, as that infant, as that, uh, you know, as that, that toddler, and somebody takes away something, or, you know, there is, then of course there's a, you know, it's, a, an, it's an incredible hurt. It's an incredible injustice. You know, it is an incredible when your needs are not centered, when your reality is not the entire, you know, version of reality, you know, it is, it's, it's shocking, it's shocking. And then you have that, <clears throat> that overreaction, that oversensitivity, um, a, a lack of resilience, really, a, a lack of stamina to be able to, and as you said, a lack of maturity. I love this, you know, the introduction of this notion of maturity. Um, it really adds something very powerful to the conversation. So maybe, I mean, I wish we could go on for another hour right now, but maybe we need to just share with our participants something about how we're going to approach the next four Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ilsa. So we're going to continue having these conversations. And we, I think in the next, um, the next four that we will be hosting, they will be holding, we, we will be delving right in, deeply, deeply in, because I feel like we've been skirting on the surface right now and we have used the architecture of um of the chakra system to create to create to create a frame um for our conversation and so these conversations will we'll be using the chakra system as a guideline for for hosting our conversation so we'll in the in the next one um, we'll be looking at the the, the first two chakras the bay the base in the sacral chakra in the other one We'll be looking at Manipura, the, the, the solar plexus and the heart chakra. And in the third one, we'll be looking at the throat chakra and the third, third eye. And in the last one, we'll be looking at the crown. We won't be looking at them necessarily, but we'll be positioning our experiences of race into, um, into the chakra meaning making system so that we get to understand what exactly is going on there um, in relation to what each chakra, what each chakra, what, what each energy center's role is in our own thriving in the world. And, and we'll be continuing like this, open, um, open, <laughs> open as we are. And, and with each, at, at, at the end of each session, we will be giving you a, um, a small gift, <laughs> a, um, a practice for you to, to delve into and perhaps to take this a little bit deeper, a little bit further. And whether you're able to come back or not is not, well, it's, I mean, we'd love for you to come back, but, um, but this last piece I'm going to share with you, this is what we would like to invite you to do as you leave the space, this is called homework. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it's called, it's about home. And it's, this is a healing practice that says, that asks you to go and find out who the people are, whose land your home is established upon. Who are the people who came before you whose land your home is established upon. So we are, we're inviting you to do a little bit of research of where you live, who occupied that land before you. And we ask you in finding out, in finding that information out, please treat that information seeking as an act of service, as an act of, um, of um, atonement, as an offering. It's your offering to say, I am doing this as my show of my intention to heal the races within, to heal whatever is not healed within myself um, with regards to race and racism. 
Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Ilza Makati, thank you so much. But what I would really like to say is I'm so excited that I have an action because I know through actions, whether I understand the action or not, that if we do little step by little step by step, that somehow there will be transformation. That is how I learn. And I invite our audience, please, to go away and do the work because these wise women have some transformation for us. And, and, and as I say, let's do the actions, even if we don't understand them. And I, I really open my heart. This conversation is so important. This has action steps. This has something that we can do at last to move towards some form of healing. I'm honored to be here today, Mahati and Ilsa. Um, I can't say much more than that. Thank you for opening your hearts. Thank you for sharing for us. Thank you for bringing your ancestors. Thank you for bringing our ancestors. It is amazing. And I have goosebumps all over. I'm tearful. I'm emotional. And that means this is amazing. So I feel very blessed to have you here. We'll see everyone on Tuesday. Please invite your friends. This is so important. Mm -hmm.